For the second time, storm clouds have gathered over the career of the British boxing star Anthony Joshua, but he steadfastly refuses to give up ground. The former champion has once again embarked on a winning streak and is ready to vie for the titles, but before that, he must contend with one of the most dangerous and unpredictable guys in the business. Many of us thought that the former UFC champion Francis Ngannou had no place in the boxing ring, but the Predator had a different opinion. On October the 28th, at a boxing event in Riyadh, he almost brought to his knees the best contemporary heavyweight, proving to all of us that writing him off is a mistake. Now Ngannou will face another threat in the heavyweight division, Anthony Joshua. Will he manage to put on another show? Will Joshua's size and technique prevail, or will Ngannou's strength and ingenuity take the lead? We'll find out the answer very soon. Meanwhile, get comfortable friends, ahead of you is the countdown to the fight between Anthony Joshua and Francis Ngannou. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe and comment in four words, and here we go. Let's get started. Not many know this, but what connects these guys is an interesting fact. Their early childhood was spent in Africa. While Francis worked in a sand quarry for a couple of bucks a day, Joshua learned discipline and hard work at a boarding school. That's where the intersection of the fates of two future athletes ends, and you already know about the further paths of each. Anthony returned to his homeland, the British Isles, and there, after going through the harsh school of life, eventually found himself in boxing. The talented young man proved himself in both the amateur and professional arenas, becoming an Olympic champion and taking the IBF title in just three years of professional competition. Soon, the champion had three belts from major organizations at his feet, but he lost them twice, first in a bout with Andy Ruiz and later in two tactical confrontations with Alexander Usyk. Nganu also didn't waste time and thanks to wild perseverance mixed with luck, managed to escape from his native Cameroon, ending up in France. From there, the future champion began his journey in sports, specifically in mixed martial arts. The road to the title turned out to be much longer than Joshua's, taking Nganu eight years, but it was worth it. Besides the belt and a substantial income, the Predator gained global fame, which he decided to leverage to fulfill his long-time dream to compete in professional boxing. The disputes with the UFC turned out to be very prolonged and didn't come easily for Nganu. However, in early 2023, he finally got rid of the contract and became a free agent. Instantly, the Cameroonian dreamer began to make plans for his boxing debut against the elite of the heavyweight division. Among those he wanted to fight were Fury, Wilder and, of course, Joshua. However, all of them declined such a match. On the surface, top boxers were ready to face Francis any day, but in reality, most of them were unwilling to put their careers on hold for a bout that wouldn't bring much to the table. Around the same time, talks began about a potential fight between Anthony and Deontay, but it didn't go beyond rumors and AJ decided to break the series of losses to Usyk by facing Jermaine Franklin, a journeyman ranked no higher than the top 25. Nevertheless, for a start, such an opponent would be just right. To the delight of all Joshua haters, the fight turned out to be absolutely uneventful. Franklin set a goal for himself, to survive at any cost, constantly trying to get close and clinch his opponent, and Joshua didn't resist much, feeling comfortable at close range. Throughout the fight, AJ threw light jabs and controlled the distance. As a result, after 12 not-so-dazzling rounds, the bodybuilder rightfully secured the victory. Maybe I could have let my hands go a bit more. Maybe this, maybe that, but that's all in the past now. And all we can look forward to is um, what's going to happen in the future. So yeah, um, it's just good to be back and getting the ball rolling again. And we're climbing, we're climbing the ladder. Meanwhile, the unemployed in Ghanu continued trying to organize a boxing match for himself, but no one was in a hurry to sign a contract with him. In the absence of alternatives, Nganu became a fighter in one of the major MMA leagues, PFL, but he had no intention of competing in mixed martial arts and continued to explore new opportunities. 
It seemed like all of the Predator's efforts were in vain. But in mid-July, there was a surprising announcement that Tyson Fury had agreed to fight him. The Gypsy King had been negotiating a meeting with Alexander Usyk for a long time, but it ended in failure due to the Britain's insatiable ambitions. Left without obvious options for a comeback, Tyson received an offer that was hard to refuse to perform at the opening of the festival in Riyadh in a 10-round bout against Nganu, and then in winter to fight Usyk. Considering the sponsor of these fights, I believe Fury received a substantial fee and Nganu finally achieved what he wanted. What was Joshua doing during this time? Well, Anthony was not idle and almost immediately after the Franklin fight, he got a new opponent and this time he was much more dangerous. The role of a threat to the former champion was played by the huge puncher and a fan of failing doping tests, Dylan White, whom AJ had defeated many years ago. After that defeat, the villain went on a streak of 11 consecutive wins but then suffered losses to Povetkin and Fury. His loss to Fury was later avenged by defeating Jermaine Franklin, albeit less convincingly than Joshua did. I think a fight between Anthony and Dylan could have been interesting, but we were not destined to see it as Dylan was once again caught doping and suspended. As a replacement on short notice, Robert Hellenius stepped in, who had become part of a fight with one of the best knockouts of 2022, albeit in the role of the victim. After a brutal fall, the Finn had already retired, but he still agreed to face Joshua. The beginning of the fight was far from spectacular. Joshua pressed, but did so hesitantly, as if afraid of getting countered. He mostly limited himself to jabs, while Hellenius was just working for his paycheck, moving around the ring. It seemed like Robert set himself the task of delivering the most passive performance possible, and he succeeded. In the fifth round, AJ landed a good shot for the first time. And by the next three minute interval, his opponent had a broken nose. But all of these were just warm ups. In the seventh round, Anthony's lead hand forced Robert to open up and in the next moment, a super powerful punch landed on the jaw. The big guy put his entire body into this punch and it was enough to send Hellenius straight to the other side. I know there's a lot of things we can improve on and I felt better than I did in April. That's, that's the main thing. But I'm not going to rate my opponents, I'll leave that to coach and the team. While Joshua was demolishing Hellenius, Nganu and Fury were in the midst of preparation. Many were convinced that Fury did not need much preparation as he could simply warm up before the fight to defeat Nganu. However, the Gypsy King approached the matter with utmost seriousness, just like Nganu. In promotional videos for the fight, Nganu was constantly seen training under the guidance of Mike Tyson, but as it turned out later, it was just a promotional move and Nganu was preparing with much more competent trainers. However, objectively, he had little chance. A debut fight in the professional ranks and against an undefeated reigning champion at that? What could he hope for? Nganu started the bout very cautiously, trying not to move unnecessarily, while Fury attacked with jabs in his standard manner. However, this cautious approach didn't last long. Fury understood that he needed to be more aggressive and break down this inexperienced opponent. But as soon as he made the first careless moves, everything suddenly went dark before his eyes. Nganu landed an incredible left hook. The heavyweight king sluggishly went down on the canvas and struggled to get back up, after which he actively defended himself until the end of the round. In the subsequent rounds, the initiative chaotically changed hands. Fury alternated between different stances, trying to either clinch or work from a distance. However, the Predator still found ways to deliver his two punch combinations and surprisingly held up well in terms of endurance. When the fight approached its end, almost all fans believed in Nganu's victory. However, by a split decision, the win went to Tyson. I don't want to go out there trying to knock him out. I don't want to go out there through heavy punches uh, because I might miss and if this fight is going to the decision, um, I might have a hard time if I um, empty my gas tank. So I was very composed. I'm like, okay, I get you. Uh, 
one thing um, when we get closer and then when we touch gloves you I'm like let take let me take you to school I'm like you mother you are not taking me to school that's why like when I knock him down I was dancing in front like you're a bad professor mother it's challenging to immediately answer the question of who outclassed whom in this fight but one thing can be said for sure Francis Ngannou performed much better than expected and now every respectable heavyweight wanted a fight with him. Eddie Hearn, for example, gave several interviews discussing the match and explaining why Joshua is stronger than both of them. He also expressed his desire to arrange a fight between his protege and the predator. I told everybody before, I met Francis Ngannou in Vegas and he wanted to fight Anthony Joshua. I was like, put it to AJ and he went, nah, look, I want to become world heavyweight champion. Almost like, what respect am I going to get for beating Francis Ngannou, a guy that's never had a fight before? Now Francis Ngannou's beaten Tyson Fury. I'm up for it. I mean, I've not spoke to AJ. He may say to me, shut up, you. I want to fight Wilder. I want to do this. Soon, Ngannou was asked about his thoughts on this fight. His response was bold. I'm willing to fight. He said he'd knock you out. He, I mean, this is what he, he said. said he, what? he said he'd knock you out. Well, but, but even Tyson Fury said the same thing, and Tyson Fury is better than Anthony Joshua. So what do I care about what people say? The proud AJ disagreed with such statements, but had no intention of giving loud interviews on this topic, let alone accepting Ngannou's challenge. Instead, Joshua continued to insist on promoting his dream fight against Deontay Wilder. The Brit had been wanting to face the bronze bomber for several years, but organizing this event had proven difficult until the Saudis intervened. As part of the Riot Festival, the Sheiks decided to organize another grand night of boxing, inviting several renowned heavyweights, including both Joshua and Wilder, though not in the same pair. Wilder's opponent was the experienced and technical Joseph Parker, while Joshua was set to face Swedish boxer Otto Wallin, who had once boxed well against Fury but still lost. Joshua delivered an exemplary performance. With a massive size advantage, he easily controlled Wallin with an outstretched arm and accurately countered if the Swede attempted to close in. Wallin constantly tried to load up on a powerful left, but Joshua easily evaded, then went on the offensive himself. Starting from the third round, the Brit actively worked with the left hook and his punch proved decisive. Wallin absorbed every side blow and seemed clueless about how to defend himself while Joshua continued to press and increasingly split with the hook. In the fifth round, Joshua landed the most significant heavy blows on Wallin, prompting the Swede to quit the fight during the break. Let's not say Otto because he's a true warrior. I think the corner play a big role in what happens to their fighter so he can live to fight another day. But um, I'm sure he would have carried on, but it's all about your vision, your timing, your reaction. And um, I'm just a gifted fighter that has a special gift and I use it to my best ability. If Joshua and Wilder had both won their opponents, a joint bout would have been arranged by spring and talks about it began even before the fighters entered the ring. At first glance, Parker and Wallin posed no threat to boxers of their calibre, and this was evident with the latter. However, Joseph confused the fans by defeating the seemingly non-threatening and seemingly unmotivated Wilder with a decisive score, shattering all dreams of an epochal showdown. Thus, Anthony was left without a potential great fight. Who could he fight now? Not Parker, as nobody wanted to watch such a bout. However, the Saudis quickly offered AJ a new option and he agreed without much hesitation. As you've understood, it was Francis Ngannou. Yes, after the fight with Fury, the Predator really wanted a rematch, which considering the split decision was warranted. However, Tyson still has to deal with Usyk. Despite my boundless respect for Ngannou, the clash between the Gypsy King and Alexander is much more crucial for the division. Nevertheless, they decided not to put Ngannou on hold and immediately unleashed him against another top opponent, which is commendable. Interestingly, just a month ago, Joshua responded to a question about a potential fight with Ngannou with clear disdain. Did Ngannou's performance against Fury add another name to that? Like, do, do you look at Ngannou now, potentially, and think, wouldn't mind that fight? From an entertainment point of view, mm. 
Yeah. From a not from a that was it. I didn't really do no gimmicks. Mm. But um if I want to do a few gimmicks, yeah, I think Ngannou's a serious think gimmick. It's a, a gimmick? In the, in the sense that now he's not that a boxer. He's ranked with the WBC now. Have no, you seen but that? he's not 10? a boxer. Like me fighting in the UFC is like gimmicky. Yeah. Uh, like I'm not a UFC fighter, but I'm a serious fighter. Mm. Like he's not a boxer, but, but he's a he, that's what I say, he's a serious gimmick. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. I'll be after I'll be on it though, definitely. It's amazing how quickly the Saudi money can change a boxer's rhetoric. However, that's not our concern. The main thing is everything is on track and we already know the date. On March the 8th, Anthony Joshua will face Francis Ngannou and this encounter will shed light on the real skill level of the Cameroonian and moreover, it will indicate whether AJ still harbors championship ambitions. We just have to wait, luckily not for much longer. And that's it. Like the video? Then be sure to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. What do you think? Who has a better chance of winning? Can Nganu surprise Joshua with something? Or was his performance against Fury just sheer luck? And Joshua will put the predator in his place. Be sure to share your opinion in the comments.